Hello, my name is Ray Hughes, and I'm the interviewer for the Veterans History Project, and we are located at the main library in Cincinnati, Ohio, and today's date is the 26th of May, 2016. Today we have the honor and privilege of speaking with David Mann, who is a veteran of the United States Navy and served during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, proper just to call you David? Please, that'd be uh, great. Uh, David, if you would, uh, where were you born in your date of birth? I was born in Cincinnati, uh, September the 25th, 1939. I see. And uh, where were you living when you were born here in Cincinnati? My family uh, was living in northern Kentucky, uh, oh. but in those days, uh, this was true of my wife too, is also from northern Kentucky. When it came time for the birth, uh, for whatever reason, we came to Christ Hospital. Or, uh, I see. So I that's see. where I saw the light of day, I'm told. <laughs> yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and where were you living at in northern Kentucky? Then? Well, uh, at that time, my folks were in the Park Hills, mm -hmm. and then uh, soon after that we moved to Fort Mitchell, and then along came the war, and uh, my dad went in the Navy, and uh, we went back to the, my mom's uh, parents in a little town in Kentucky called Horse Cave, um, which is near Mammoth Cave, and uh, some of my earlier earliest memories are there. My dad went overseas and then uh, he got two sets of orders. He was, he was in an invasion of uh, Sicily and he got two sets of orders. One was to go to England, I guess to prepare for the invasion of Normandy. He uh, was a beach landing officer at the invasion of Sicily. And then he got a second set of orders that said come back to the States and uh, adjust the compasses of ships in the Brooklyn Naval Shipyard. So my dad, I guess, was still an instance, so he asked somebody, which set of orders should I follow? And the fellow said, if it were me, I'd, I'd assume they know what they're talking about and, and take the orders that say, go back to the States. So he came back, and then uh, he was able to get housing for a while, so we lived in the Bronx, of all places. And, and uh, that's where I began, I tell people, I began my public education in the Bronx, and then we lost the housing, and back to Horse Cave, and so, uh, I rolled into Horse Cave with a, uh, a New York accent, and I couldn't talk without using my hands, and my mom sent me to school with knickers on, and uh, the farm boys with bib overalls uh, didn't know what to make of me, so I had a lot of adjustment to make real quickly. And uh, then after the war, after my, my dad came back up here to be employed, and then when we were able to get housing, I think 47 or 48, we uh, ended up in, in Park Hills, back to Park Hills. I so. see. And uh, so at 47, 48, you're nine years old. What school did you go to over there? Park Hills Elementary School in Park Hills. I see. Yeah. And then for high school? Dixie Heights. Dixie Heights, uh -huh. yeah. At, um, uh, what years were you at Dixie Heights? Well, I graduated in 57. Interestingly enough, uh, one Ron of my Ziegler, classmates, huh? Was Ron Ziegler one of well, your? Well, I was gonna say, he was, he was my classmate. You know, he was a classmate of mine too. Uh, Where? <laughs> uh, we attended Concordia Lutheran School. Okay, uh, in Park Hills? No, it was um, over here in Cincinnati. Oh. It was, uh, this is interviewing about me, but, <laughs> but Ron and I were, in this, we were confirmed together also. Uh, really? Yes. Well, that's uh, interesting. Uh, his mother was Ruby, if I remember correctly, and uh, uh, the school we went to uh, was Two rooms. Okay. First four grades were on the first floor in one room. Okay. And the second four grades were in the second floor in one room. We had two old German teachers, uh, Friedrich Kohlmorgen and uh, Friedrich uh, Troike. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, uh, Ron was a, uh, until he went to high school at Dixie Heights, and I went to Hughes. But he 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 came to Park Hills while I was there. Uh, part way through, I think, maybe mm -hmm. in the fifth or sixth grade, but we went to high school together. He married the um, prom queen and uh, the most beautiful girl in the class, uh, Nancy uh, Plessinger, and um, of course, then they went to, well, after graduation, he went to California. They hadn't gone together, and then the next thing I knew, uh, he was uh, one of Nixon's, uh, he was Nixon's press secretary. Press secretary correct. And then the next time I, I uh, circled around to, to Ron when it was when I was in Congress, of course, uh, he then was out of uh, governmental service, but he, he ran a, uh, 
a PAC, I think the uh, chain, chain Drug Store uh, Association, which also had a PAC, so he was nice enough to, uh, even though we were on different sides of the aisle, uh, personally, he was nice enough to help me. And I remember after the election, I had a debt. And of course, when you've lost an election, it's hard to raise money. Who can? So I, I, I contacted Ron, and he uh, he helped me with my debt with uh, with his pack. So yeah, yeah, it's a small world. It's a small it? world, and he's yes. you may know he's deceased. He um, yes had heart trouble, but um, well, our uh, Mr. Cole Morgan, uh, uh, we had another fellow who ended up in the workhouse, and uh, he said, you know, I had one in the White House and one in the workhouse. <laughs> <laughs> but well, that's, anyway. that's true of all of us, right? <laughs> and you never know which is which. Uh, yeah, and uh, so after, uh, did you play sports in high school like uh, Ron did? I wanted to. You know, only, the only thing I played was golf. And uh -huh. I, I tell people that my greatest, my first disappointment in life was when I did not make the basketball team. Yeah. I was too small for football, uh, but I got a letter in golf, yeah. not that anybody cared too much, but our, te our, our school had great teams uh, that year. Uh, the football team was uh, the second best in the state, and uh, the basketball team went to the state tournament, which was unusual for, North, uh, for our school, so no, we, had a, we had a good class. What, one of our, one of our uh, basketball stars played for U UofL and uh -huh. uh, hired Stacy. So, so uh, after high school, did you go to college? I did go to college, and uh, I had a Navy scholarship. The Navy uh, put my way through college, and uh, in return, I gave the Navy back four years. So uh, where did you go to college? Uh, Harvard College. Harvard. I did. I see. And uh, so that was my first exposure. Except, you know, I guess the reason I was interested in the Navy was because of my dad. And of course, as you know, at that point, uh, we were all being chased by the draft. So an opportunity to get a commission plus. Uh, uh, had my way paid through Harvard, wasn't a bad deal. And um, as I tell people, uh, when I got to my service, I realized that uh, actually I got the better part of the deal because I enjoyed the Navy so much. It wasn't like the four years were uh, a penal period for the benefits of, of college. So uh, uh, I, I enjoyed it, got a lot, it meant a lot to me in, in terms of personal growth. But while I was at Harvard, I was the uh, and you know, we had a, a midshipman battalion, and when I was a senior, I was the the midshipman commanding officer of the battalion. So, outstanding. outstanding. I, you know, I, I said, forward march, and a couple hundred midshipmen did it. Yeah. <laughs> Such power. <laughs> uh, so, what year did you graduate? Sixty-one. Sixty-one. Mm -hmm. And um, what was your major? I majored in the biochemistry. Oh, biochemistry. Ah. <laughs> yeah. <I don't. laughs> yeah. Well, now you can bisect this, <laughs> but uh, that's good. I thought I was going to be a doctor, I and, see. and so it, it uh, for some reason science it came easy to me. And it, uh, it, uh, I was at first I was a history major, but I was spending so much time with the mandatory science courses. I said, well, you know, it'd be easier just to do science. So yeah. that's what I did. So uh, it looks like immediately after graduating, you joined the service. I did. I was uh, commissioned the same day I graduated, and. Uh, Within a week, I found my way in Norfolk, waiting for my ship to come in. <laughs> so, now, did you have to go through basic training? You, you joined in June of '61. Uh, yeah, but see, but uh, the the NROTC program, I'd had three summer cruises. The first cruise, I was on a sh uh, ship as a sailor, and uh, you know, learned how to chip paint and right. uh, clean bilges, and uh, you know. Uh, related to uh, wh what the life of a, a sailor was on, on a destroyer. And then the second year we spent uh, three weeks in Virginia under the tutelage of a uh, Marine DI, drill instructor. Drill instructor. And then uh, three weeks in uh, uh, Corpus Christi, Texas under the, uh, uh, with the Navy Airedale. So the, the idea is expose you to the different options that you might have when you got commissioned. and then. Uh, the third year, back to a, a sea, and I was on the aircraft carrier out of uh, in, in the Mediterranean for six weeks. So I'd had a fair amount of, you know, experience. Plus, you take courses in the, the basics: Navy history, Navy engineering, celestial navigation, leadership, um, things like that. So you're about as ready as you can be. Now, you know, Nissan doesn't know anything. <laughs> Of course, there's nothing quite as bad as reporting aboard a ship and, you know, and right. 
and standing in front of about 20 sailors. I mean, I was put in charge of the gunner's mates, and the, the average age, age of the gunner's mates was probably in her 30s, and so, you know, yeah. I, and I looked, uh, I looked terribly young, uh, even for my age, and so anyway, I, I, that's why I say I had to learn a lot about what it takes to develop relations with people, and you know, as I tell people, they would salute me because they had to. They would say yes, sir, because they had to. But if I really um, was going to have their respect, and uh, if we we're going to collaborate in a positive way, you know, the onus was on me to show them that um, uh, I deserve some respect. So yeah. I had to learn a lot. It so was a good, good lesson. So what was your first ship in, um, at Norfolk? Uh, a destroyer named the USS English, which was a, a World War II uh, destroyer, DD-696. It was named after Admiral English, who I, I read a, a, a couple books I read this past year by uh, an author named Toll, T-O-L-L. -L. Just wrote a trilogy. Oh, yeah. He's on the third one now. Yeah. Oh. So uh, I, this is the first I uh, understood who Ad, why Admiral English had a uh, ship named after him, but he was, he was on the, uh, he was an aviator, and he was on the staff of, um, um, who was it in, in Pearl Harbor? Hall, not Halsey, but the people, the one Halsey reported to. Uh, Nimitz. Nimitz, yeah, yeah. So anyway, but, but flying back to the States, uh, his plane with a number of uh, high-ranking officers got lost out and, and hit a mountain trying to find San Francisco. And, you know, just reminds you that, you know, what you know is a former, uh, someone who flew that, that it wasn't always, we didn't always have the benefit of always knowing where, where we were. were. So, right. so I guess he was highly thought of, so uh, the ship was named after him. Um, it was an old ship, but uh, it had just been, in fact, I had to wait uh, about 10 days in Norfolk because the ship had been involved in some sort of uh, flare up in the Dominican Republic. So uh, I, I report to uh, the pier where my ship is supposed to be, and it's not there. So. I go to what's called a destroyer tender. It's one pier over, and um, so I'm trying to report to the, my ship. And I said, "Well, it's not here yet." And I said, "Well, you take me." And they said, "Well, we'll take your papers, but but you need to go stay in the BOQ, the bachelor's offers quarter. Right. And we have nothing for you to do. So for next week, I'd play golf every day, which you know I, I was it was driving me crazy because I was ready to get started." Right. So the day it came back, I was there and anxiously, you know, waiting. And of course, I don't know how long they'd, they'd been gone, so they weren't, uh, they were anxious, to, you know, the ones that were gonna be uh, free that night were anxious to get off the ship. But I reported to a fellow who has remained a friend. Uh, I, he was on the quarter deck and he still laughs at how nervous I felt. <laughs> so, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Request permission to come aboard, sir. And so uh, anyway, I got, I, um, uh, was assigned to the what was called the uh, gunnery department, uh, and I was in charge of the gunner's mates who had responsibility for our, our armament, the five inch 38 mounts and the three inch 50 mounts, mm -hmm. all of which were World War II level uh, uh, cap uh, weapons. Or, right. And then we, in September, we took our first cruise. We had a seven month cruise to the Mediterranean uh, on the sixth in the sixth fleet, which was really my um, baptism under fire in terms of shipboard life. And for uh, seven months, I, we had a one in three watch rotation. So you would be on watch four hours, be off eight hours. And if, if the eight hours, uh, if the four hours that you're on watch happen to be from midnight to four, then guess what? You didn't get to sleep. When, you know, the ship turned two at eight, you were expected to be out and about. So. One of my memories is, of course, you're young and you need sleep anyways, being sleepy all the time. But I learned a lot that cruise. Uh, it was uh, otherwise, uh, I don't, uh, nothing of great moment happened except I just, you know, I got qualified as an officer of the deck, which means I could, I could take responsibility for running, running the ship around in the middle of the night. Uh, uh, this, and is, this is 1961, yeah. and, uh, and still uh, a preponderance of World War II veterans. In the Navy. Oh, absolutely, so and, and World War II wet-style weapons, you know. Yeah, did you serve uh, with any World War II veterans well, on, on the English? Yeah, we had a, we had a few plank, what we call plank owners, people right. had been there when the ship was commissioned, right. and a lot of people had been in, you know, 
as you say, uh, people that had come in in late 40s, or you know, 44, 45, right. they they uh, they hadn't their, did not have their 20 years yet. So. Right. So. Yeah. so that was a seven month cruise, you yep. say, in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Any experiences in the Mediterranean that, um, that when you're ashore or anything like that? Well, I mean, uh, this is peacetime. The dollar is strong. I, I was paid $258 a month and I couldn't spend it. And, uh, you know, the, the, the routine is not. Uh, Liberty will start at four o'clock, and uh, don't get in trouble. Don't do anything you shouldn't. And the museums are all closed <laughs> before four o'clock, so so you end up uh, visiting a lot of things you probably shouldn't. But you know, yeah. it was interesting. I forgot to tell you, I was at Langley for a while. You yeah. know, and we used to we used to uh, just dread when you guys came back in from sea duty because you had all the money. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's there right. wasn't any point in going downtown. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Absolutely right. But um, so when you come back uh, from your seven month then tour, uh, what did you do? Well, then I was sent to Key West to learn how to be a uh, anti-submarine warfare officer, and that's about a uh, six week school, and uh, that was fun. It was, uh, as I recall, April. It wasn't too hot down there yet, but. Uh, uh, the Navy had a, 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 a base that's no longer there. Included within the base was uh, Harry Truman's summer White House. Of course, he, he's no longer in the picture at this point, but uh, it was a nice base, and you, you uh, learn how destroyers are supposed to try to handle submarines. Now, this is the point at which submarines are transitioning from diesel boats to nuclear boats that have the ability to uh, steam uh, much faster than destroyers, and you know it's it's really no contest. But you know we we went through the motions, and so when I went back to the ship after that in June, I guess um, I was uh, ASW officer, and what? then and then you know when we weren't over uh, deployed, we would have periodic uh, uh, weeks or, or a week or two weeks at a time operating. Uh, there was something called the Virginia Capes where we would go out for exercises. But uh, <clears throat> the summer was pleasant, and this is the summer of 62. And meanwhile, uh, I'm courting my, uh, the woman I married later, and she was spent the summer working in Asheville, North Carolina. And it was only an eight hour drive from Norfolk to Asheville without any interstate. So for some reason, it seemed to make sense to leave Norfolk at 4 p.m. on a Friday, drive eight hours, um, of course, she was working at a YMCA facility, so we were separate. <laughs> and then uh, I had to leave there Sunday at 4 p.m. and get back to Norfolk at midnight. And, you know, youth is wasted on the young, as they say. <laughs> but uh, so that's that's my memory that summer. And then uh, we, by by sheer chance, uh, we were operating in. Uh, I mean, the next event is the Cuban Missile Crisis, and uh, we happened to be operating uh, off the coast of Florida with the Independence, and I spent the weekend in uh, Jacksonville, Mayport, um, and our, one of the memorable things about that was that uh, one of, a couple of our sailors decided it would be a smart idea to drive away with a, a fire truck, and fortunately, before we had to go to sea, the, a judge understood that the best thing to do was to uh, not to be too, to be a little bit tolerant, and the, the sailors came back and the Navy took care of <laughs> the discipline. Um, but at this point, the, the thing that changed when I came back to the ship was now I was in charge, not of gunner's mates, but uh, sonarmen and torpedomen, uh, which were uh, different, uh, uh, the Navy, cat, you know, people quali qualify for different specialties, and the specialties tend to be based on skills and so forth. So uh, sonarmen and torpedomen uh, are uh, jobs that require a lot of uh, technical abilities. So it tends to be people that uh, would have facility with, you know, today with computers and electronics. So because there was a lot of maintenance required. So the sailors that I was now responsible for uh, were younger 
uh, more sophisticated. And so the things I had to be and do to relate to them uh, were somewhat different than uh, what was required to relate to Gunner's Mates. I'm not saying this very well, but you know, different yeah. What groups ship are you on now? I'm right still on the same, I've gone back to the English. English, okay. Yeah. And um, so, uh, in any event, uh, we're in Jacksonville. We, we, uh, we go out to sea with the independents. And on Thursday, we're supposed to be released to, to go back to Norfolk. The independents was, uh, was home based in, in uh, Mayport. And uh, about four in the afternoon, we got a, a flashing light signal that said, follow me. And the independents, turned south and uh, increased his speed quite a bit. And we weren't told why or how long. So we followed her through the night and we were in Cuban waters on Friday. And- uh, What dates are these, do you recall? I used to recall- the, Is this the, October? Or? Yeah, yeah, the president's speech to the country was on Monday. So this is the Thursday and Friday before his speech. I think his speech was on October 22nd. I think that mm -hmm. it's that Monday. And that's when we knew why we were there on, on uh, 9 p.m. Eastern time. And we listened to the speech. But um, uh, so in any event, we're in Cuban waters on Friday. Uh, the president, or not, the, the, our, the captain says, I want you to arm the weapons we use against submarines. And I also want us to uh, uh, rehearse our gunfire support because there's the invasions tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and because if, if there were an invasion, we would be called upon to provide artillery support uh, because we can get a lot closer in than uh, cruisers and whatever ships that might be there. So we did that, and then one of the funny things was, so I went down to my, you know, I don't know how to arm, what, we had something called hedgehogs. I don't know how to arm them, so I go down to my sonarman, and my lead sonarman is 22 or something, and I'm 23, and I said, we gotta, we gotta arm the hedgehogs. And uh, he looks at me and says, I've never done that. And uh, I said, find someone who's done it. Nobody had done it. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I went and got a book, you know, with their manuals and stuff. Right. And the problem was it was, the manual was like uh, Mark IV uh, hedgehog fuses and what we had were Mark Vs. So we kind of extrapolated and one, one son Norman and I went up, the hedgehogs were on the, the uh, hedgehog, hedgehog delivery mechanism, uh, it was a weird kind of, you know, the hedgehogs are about this big and, and they have a charge of maybe a 50 pound explosive. And uh, unlike depth charges, they don't explode unless they actually hit the submarine. Depth charges, the problems with depth charges are when you get to the assigned depth, they, they explode and if they haven't hit anything, that completely screwed up your sonar capability till the water crisis. So that's why, and the hedgehogs go out in front of the ship about uh, uh, 300 yards instead of, and depth charges are behind. And in terms of tracking a, a submarine, you know a lot more about where it is while it's ahead of you than when it's behind you. Uh, so anyway, we, we, we think we got the mar. We never had to use them and, and we don't know. And then the torpedoes had to be armed and uh, the depth charges, so. How many that, torpedoes did the- uh, We had six. Six? six. Mm -hmm. right. and they, they were acoustic uh, homing torpedoes and uh, they were supposed to be pretty good. Um, so- uh, So you're there the whole weekend? Yeah, and, and so, and, and then the next thing we think we're gonna be, in, and meanwhile we're screening, you know, we're providing, it's called screening the ships steam ahead of carriers and supposedly we protect them from submarines and so forth and uh, we're doing that and then uh, the president's speech at one point we get sent off we think we're going to intercept a quarantine a vessel that we're trying to quarantine then we get called back and then the rest of the month we just sailed around and uh, uh, waited for something to happen and you know it, it was pretty scary for two or three days and then it just kind of routine and you, you did you, you see any of the uh, uh, Russian vehicle uh, no, uh, no, ships no or anything? and um, the only other I mean we, we had routines we followed I mean uh, I mean 
one of the, one of the most interesting. So I'm the I'm the ASW officer, and one, and and uh, the sonarmen are always sending out sound, and they're listening to the echoes. And right. if you get a strong echo, you mean there's it means there's something out there. So we get a strong echo, and it I mean, it's it's a highly probable contact. And when you have a contact, the protocol is not general quarters, but we we set the uh, uh, ASW attack team. And I was I, my my station at that time was down below the mess decks where the the sonar gear was, and that's where I was supposed to be. So so we hear, even I heard could tell this is this is real. So I tell the captain, and then uh, we set. Uh, ASW attack team blue, and uh, I'm the officer of the deck, and I'm supposed to wait till I'm relieved, and I'm so excited I leave the bridge to head down to my station. So the captain comes out there, and my relief comes out there, and you know they they have to find out from the the the, the crew on the bridge. Well, where are you at? Is he okay? I mean. <laughs> but the captain was kind about it, but that was like, funny. And then, but so we, 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 we had it for a little while and then we lost contact. And then um, um, I remember one night there was a submarine, it must have been one of ours because it, uh, it was on the surface. And then it turns on its lights and then it dives and you know, we were about to collide, and we didn't see it till it turned on its lights. So, I think it was one of ours. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. You know, wars. I mean, whatever. Uh, but you, you know, happily. How close to Cuba were you at these time at, during this time? I, I don't know. You know, 20 miles, 50 miles. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and we sailed around, and uh, as long as we were with a carrier, I mean, the carrier just wanted to remain. You know, within a hundred miles, I guess, and and we were worrying about Russian submarines, and you know, it, right. for a few days, it was a very yeah. tense period because nobody knew exactly what was going to happen. And as you read about it later, uh, it was it would have been easy for a really bad mistake to have been made. Absolutely, and we're yeah. very lucky that uh, some cooler heads prevailed. Yes. Um. It, it makes you think of Curtis LeMay it flashes to mind there when you said cooler, yeah. cooler heads prevailed, oh, fortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because he was, uh, as I remember, he was for all out uh, wasting them. Well, I mean, I mean this, this, is, this is the week that Kennedy earned his pay, I mean, truly, because yes. I think he was, he was uh, getting pulled and pushed a lot of ways. And Certainly. Yeah. Um, so how long did you stay down in those waters, and when, when effectively was the uh, crisis over? Would you say we got home by Thanksgiving? Okay, that's my memory. And uh, but uh, you know, I remember. I mean, one of my duties is where. I mean, our ship only had about fifteen officers, and after you, the captain, the executive officer, and the, what we call the supply officer, the person that was sort of the business person for the ship, then the rest of us stood watches and, and including amongst our duties was to decode messages. In those days it was a manual process. You would get um, you, you would get a sheet of paper with a bunch of uh, um, alphabetic characters in, in five in, in caps in groups of five. And it was gibberish and what you were supposed to do was to take this device, uh, it, was, it was a cylinder that you opened up and based on uh, your code book, there were these rotors that you set, and there were about ten rotors. And uh, if you got them, if you got one of them wrong, you would learn later when you and you would type in the the gibberish, and then at the other end, you were supposed to get a message. Right. And that's when you would know that you'd made a mistake. So you would have to open up the cylinder again, uh, review. Uh, the guides that you were supposed to be following and make sure and it was easy to make a mistake. So anyway, I remember in the middle of the night when it was very hot uh, because this, there was very little air conditioning on the ship and uh, the message was the Christmas trees have been uh, shipped out of New Hampshire and they'll be there. So, so they were anticipating we might still be down there in yeah. December. <laughs> I see. So, oh. mm. so you got home uh, 
you got back to port by uh, thanks Thanksgiving. Yeah, then, I see, and that's back to Norfolk. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got home for Christmas, and uh, um, my soon-to-be wife was. Incidentally, you didn't give us her, her name. Betsy. And her maiden name was. Uh, Tolliver. Tolliver. Spelled T-A-L-I-A-F-E-R-R-O. Tolliver. Uh, we've been married 52 years, and um, her brother was in the Navy. Um, at, well, he was he was at uh, OCS at that time, getting ready to be commissioned, and her uncle had gone to the Naval Academy, had been um, uh, an officer during during World War II, mm -hmm. so so she had some ties to the Navy also, and we were married in our in my uniform. Uh, when did you get married? Sixty three. In sixty three, mm -hmm. so oh, was, when you came home though uh, for Christmas. Uh, uh, she was glad to see me. 62. 62. Yeah, right. Right You're after not the crisis. Yet, no. Though. Okay. Right. But she, she, she grew up in Erlanger. Uh -huh. So. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of Tollivers in this area. Do you know? Do you know Phil Tolliver? I know, I, certainly. Yeah. That's her brother. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. What a small world. Yeah. yeah. So he's the one I'm talking about. He was at OCS at the time uh, to be a to be a. Uh, he became a Navy lawyer. Yeah. yeah. Um, Phil still. Uh, I see him about oh two or three times, at least a month, or maybe if if not more than that. Um, we uh, work out at the YMCA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, and uh, he's trying to decide whether they have hip surgery. Oh, is he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I sorry to interrupt you there. No, but, no. Uh, at uh, so you're uh, this is uh, Christmas. You came home on leave. And uh, your leave's over, where do you report back to then? Well, go back to Norfolk, and, and now we have another Mediterranean cruise. This is a five-month cruise. We leave in April, I think, and come back in uh, early September. This is April of? 63. Uh, 63. And, and uh, while I'm, before I go, we get engaged in March, and then uh, my wife-to-be uh, has to plan a wedding without me. <laughs> I'm on the cruise. So and you're still on the English. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, and that cruise uh, was summertime, and of course, you know, contrary to popular opinion, I mean, the Mediterranean is 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 cool in in the winter. I mean, not, not I don't you don't see much snow, but it's you know it's it's not you don't swim in the uh, uh, winter time in the Mediterranean. So in the summer, it was a different experience, different cruise, and. Um, I don't, I don't know there's anything memorable, just some more interesting ports to, to go to. Uh, I don't know whether there's, a, was there, any, were there any? I Did you guys stop in Africa or any? Uh, no, I, the only time I, I was in Morocco once, when I f flew over one of my midshipman cruises. Uh, there's a, there's a, air bay, uh, a Navy air station in, uh, I forget the name of the city. Hmm. I'm not that familiar with it, yeah. with the naval part of it there. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but, but you know, we, we pulled into port frequently, and I mean, Italy was the most common stopping point. I've been to Naples many times, and, right? Um, other ports, and and I, and I love Italy. I've, I've I try to I've traveled back there quite often. France, Spain, Greece. Um, so. um, at this time, uh, I think we're getting involved in Vietnam, aren't we? Uh, in 1963, beginning to. I mean, yeah. I don't. Uh, um, Are you aware of that at this time? While you, you know, I, not, probably not much. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, the most memorable thing in the summer of '63 was the the um, civil rights movement. Wait, I'm, I'm mixing up with my years. Uh, well. I mean, Kenny was shot in 62, huh? 60, uh, November the 22nd of 63 is when Kennedy was shot. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I'm uh -huh. sorry. Because after the cruise, we get married in October. Uh, my ship is, yeah, my ship is uh, in the shipyard in Charleston, and that's where we are when Kennedy is shot. In fact, we're leaving 
that's the day we were leaving the ship we to go back to at that point the ship had been transferred to Mayport um, and uh, my wife was sick and so I, I was taking leave to drive her back and and so we had a, one last sea trial I went to sea with the ship that morning and while we well, we heard about it while we were out there and you know I remember the executive officer saying uh, just get ready for some um, uh, heightened alerts because nobody knows exactly what's going on because you know it wasn't clear what had happened who had caused right. it, what have you so anyway so then after the sea trial I went back to the shore with the pilot in the pilot's boat and then I remember finding my wife crying when I got to the place where we were staying so anyway and we spent the whole weekend like everybody else watching the television right. so then we drove to uh, back to Mayport to so, um, so you ask about Vietnam. So I, you know, I don't. Um, the Gulf of Tonkin was what? Is it? Uh, that was in '64. Uh, '64. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, um, the Berlin crisis was somewhere in there. So when I was uh, in Key West in the spring of '62, there were a lot of reservists that had been called up, and the, one of the training ships that we went out on was a reservist ship. Uh, and, I, and I, the captain I know had been called back to active duty, and I guess that was earlier in 61? 61, yeah. 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 So, you know, this was the Cold War, and you know, we all were living with it and through it. But we, so, uh, uh, so I, I, you know, what I was gonna say though about, I'm, I'm, okay, so now we lose uh, Kennedy. What am I? Uh, and I think you uh, brought your wife back home here to Northern Kentucky? Yeah. yeah. So then where did you go after that as far as duty? Um, I, my last year I, I was an aide to a uh, two-star admiral who, who... So now we're into... Uh, uh, early, 60, early 64. Yeah. Okay. And he's in Norfolk, so I go there and uh, am on a succession of cruisers with him. Um, although I ended up serving three admirals, I think, in the in 15 months, and that was a good assignment. I mean, I, my, the executive officer of the English became a, a dear friend, and uh, he had, you know, his second duty was as an aide to the uh, admiral, and he, he was trying to persuade me I ought to think about a career. So it, it was, you know, it was a, uh, a neat opportunity, and I enjoyed it, and uh, somewhere in there I decided, well, this is a hard life to have a family. I mean, that really is what it came down to. But uh, that 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 was somewhere in late '64. So I, I I joined that that staff in, in spring of '64. We lived in Norfolk, and um, the longest cruise I had after that was about six weeks. We uh, we went to Northern Europe uh, in the fall to uh, uh, Amsterdam. I mean, we we worked in in the North Sea. So I have, I have vivid memories of. Bear bombers flying over, and you could see the, you know, just s similar to what the Chinese are doing. The Where South were China you at team. when you saw the uh, bear? Was I what? Where were you at when you saw? Well, I was on the bridge of uh, the cruiser. And, and we're at though. Uh, somewhere in the North Sea. I mean, north of Ireland. North. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, we we were just in exercises, and the bear was a multi-engine bomber that the Russians used, along with the bison. But you, I mean, I could see the pilot is, is or somebody the, in the cockpit, you know, they right? were that close to us, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. It had to be an eerie feeling. Well, sure, yeah. Uh, my goodness. I know. Uh, and they were still using World War II aircraft because the, the bear and the bison both were from World War II. And, uh, but they had nukes, so that, that equalized things, I guess. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, that we're, this is 1964. Uh, so you ask about, I don't know when Vietnam crept in my, into my consciousness. I mean, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin. It was August of 64, if I remember correctly. Okay. Now that, you know, I'm on the East Coast. Uh, uh, Westpac is more impacted um, initially. And um, we've, at this point, or in Mayport, we've become a, uh, Naval Reserve training ship. So, 
uh, we, we are no longer quite top of the line. Well, of course, then I'm on the, on the staff. Um, so I don't, I don't recall anything memorable except we get to 65. I decide I'm going to leave the Navy, give up my uh, uh, commission as a, a USN versus a USNR, and uh, decide to go to law school. What and rank are you? Uh, uh, lieutenant. Uh, when I left, I was lieutenant. lieutenant. Yeah. And um, um, from January to June, when you're uh, discharged from the Navy, uh, w what are your duties in 65? Are you still take on care of the admiral? Still I, I mean, staff? I mean, I was I was his personal aide. It's called in the Navy. It's called uh, uh, flag lieutenant. And so I'm supposed to t make sure, I mean, I'm in charge of all the uh, enlisted personnel that serve him. I, I had three Marines who drove his car, uh, the, the folks who uh, uh, handled his the fl so-called flag mess, prepared meals and so forth. He had a band. Uh, and of course, when we were at sea, the band members also stood watch. There was a, at, at sea, we had a what we call flag plot where we, you know, kept track of uh, all the ships that might be under his command. Um, so, it was, you know, I was learning more and more things. Mm -hmm. it was an, and uh, uh, the, the, in terms of Vietnam, the thing I recall is, so I've decided I'm going to go to law school. And just weeks before I'm supposed to be discharged, I get a call from a detailer in the Pentagon who says, well, would you stay 90 more days? I said, well, I'm going to go to law school. I said, if I did, would you promise to let me out? He said, I can't do that. I said, you know, you've had four years. I've got to go. And I, and I felt some regret because, you know, suddenly the country was calling in a different way. But, you know, I had made my decision. And, and a couple of buddies I'd gone to college with who went to the same law school and who had been in the Navy were kept in the, ne the extra three months. And then he got out just before it was time to um, start school. So, uh, so you're actually discharged. What date was that? Do you June. It was June of '65. June of '65. June. You want the exact date? <laughs> and when did you start? The 26, I think. Where did you start the law school at? I went to Harvard. Harvard again. It started okay. September. And uh, how long was that? Three years. Three years. Mm -hmm. Now we're at 1968. 68. Yeah. And, uh, do you return to Cincinnati at yep, that time? Yeah, yeah. So when we came back and, you know, our families were in northern Kentucky, we decided to slip over here and have lived in Cincinnati ever since. Ever since? Yeah. 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 Uh, what did you do for a living then when you got Well, out? I joined a law firm called Dinsmore Shoal, uh, which is one of the big firms in town, and um, practiced there for about 13 years. And somewhere along the way, early on, I got involved in politics and uh, was on council in 74 and uh, was mayor in 81 and 82 and uh, in 83 I joined uh, Phil Tolliver and we, we organized a firm that and my office was in Cincinnati and of course he had his office in Covington mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and I did that till uh, and then I continued to serve on council I, I became mayor again in 1991 uh, 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 and then was elected to Congress in 92. In 94, I was unelected to Congress and um, became a private citizen. And now I practice law with my son. We have a firm called Man and Man. And uh, then three years ago, I lost my mind and uh, sought election to Cincinnati City Council. And the voters lost their minds, and I'm there. So you're, you're on you're I'm on council and the mayor. City uh, Council in Cincinnati. Yeah, and the mayor. He has one of his powers is to appoint one of the nine members as the vice mayor. So I'm the vice mayor, which doesn't mean much except I fill fill in for him on occasion. And uh, if should he get hit by a car, God forbid, you know, I yeah. become mayor. Well, this is uh, has to be a real trying time to be on the city council in Cincinnati and <laughs> all the social problems that we've been having lately and. Uh, well, well, a lot of good things are happening in Cincinnati right now. I mean, uh, the economy is good, which helps a lot. So our revenues are up. Uh, there's a lot of development going on. I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of uh, uh, construction, uh, commercial and otherwise. 
uh, and over the Rhine is, well, you, right. when you're going over the Rhine, it's not what you remember, right? No, that's right. <laughs> and, and there was a period in Very there. Very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was at a but, press conference this morning. Uh, we're uh, there on Ray Street, and we're trying to uh, balance that with some city support for what we call affordable housing. Because right. when we get all done, we don't want over the Rhine to be just a place for uh, the wealthier, uh, the affluent. It, it right. needs to, there needs to be a balance, and I. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, the unemployment rate, uh, particularly in the black community, is un unhappily high, and uh, the community will never be at rest unless we can address that. So That's true. we're doing some That's things true. to try to do that too. Yeah. Um, I neglected to ask you how many children you have. We have three. Three. Uh, and a boy, girl, boy. The older is, uh, the, and they're all in their 40s. <laughs> the oldest is uh, my law partner. My daughter, Debbie, is a uh, social worker. And uh, my son, Marshall, they all live in Cincinnati. Uh, he provides um, food service up at the Moorline Brewery up here in the tap room up here in the, oh, okay. um, over the run. Now, did you, was your wife employed at any time? She still is. Oh, is she? She's a social worker at a nursing home. I see. Yeah. I see. And uh, we 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 don't believe in retirement, so we're trying to hold on as long as you know. Yeah. Uh, we we think. Uh, well, I think public service is important, and she thinks, and I agree with her. Uh, social work is important, so. Uh, so we try to have a purpose every day. We have five grandchildren, all of whom live in Cincinnati. And, uh, which is a great gift. And you look, you look extremely healthy, I might add. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> it looks like you've led a great life, both well, to the community and to yourself. Well, I try, I mean, I, I, I smoked for 20 years, I can't believe yeah. it. But, yeah. but I just celebrated the 40th anniversary of not of stopping smoking. And I tell people I feel better today than I did the day I stopped smoking. I mean, you know, that's what yeah, absolutely. smoking does to you. Yeah. But, I, you know, I try to be active. And at City Hall, there are uh, 85 steps from the... Uh, street to the third floor, which is where council chambers are, and I haven't used the elevator yet, so. Outstanding, outstanding. Um, Brian, uh, we're nearing the end of our interview. I just wondered if you had any questions. I just have a couple of questions. Sure. Could you, what was the, what's the, you were uh, working with the admirals, what would be a daily day in the life of an admiral? You said it had a, Sure. I mean, I mean, depend on whether we were at sea or not. And, and uh, when we were at sea, he was busy. When we were not at sea, we might not be terribly busy. And this fellow had been uh, uh, commissioned in the uh, like 35 or something. He'd been at Pearl Harbor, and and as he said himself, that um, he his name was Ed King. And he said that uh, a few years earlier, there'd been no question he'd been an admiral. And a few years later, he probably wouldn't be an admiral because his particular career was uh, simply being a shipboard officer. And, you know, increasingly, uh, there was a requirement of specialties. You had to know missiles or you had to know intelligence or something like that. So he could, he could see the Navy uh, changing. Uh, and he prided himself on being a, a ship handler. He had written a book about ship handling. And, you know, he, he was uh, um, a no-nonsense kind of guy, and as long as you did what he wanted, I mean, he also, he also had a gracious uh, side. Now, this is the one I spent the most time with. The first one I uh, worked with for a few months was the son of a uh, member of the Marine general from World War II called Howling Mad Smith. Yeah. Well, this was his son. <laughs> and and uh, uh, he, he was, you know, an admiral is an admiral. You know, you, they, they want what they want, and they get it. And that's okay, there's a certain command presence that, but some of them are, uh, uh, inspire more respect naturally than others do, but you know, they're just human beings and they've, they've had successes. Um, you know, I have to tell a story on myself. So in the fall of 64, uh, uh, the ship goes to uh, Amsterdam and the Admiral was a great golfer and he had a golf date with somebody and uh, the, Netherlands Navy had assigned a, uh, uh, an assistant to the marine drivers uh, to help make sure the Admiral didn't get lost. And, uh, 
after about a day, I asked the, the main driver, I said, is this, okay? are you okay? He said, yeah, it's a piece of, piece of cake. So I, on my own, told the uh, Netherlands sailors that we didn't need any more. So the Admiral went off for a golf date and about an hour later he came back. I said, and it was a very rainy day. I said, too much rain? He said, some fool discharged my driving assistant from the Dutch Navy. So. <laughs> we didn't know who it was, of course. <laughs> no, he knew, he knew. So, so the chief of staff that evening said, the Admiral uh, wants you to stay on the ship this weekend. So I, I was restricted, which is, of course had never happened to me. And I just, I felt terrible and I was, I, I, it took me a while to blame myself, although I was the one who was responsible. And uh, the Admiral later gave me a bit of a uh, talking to about the difference between the Army and the Navy, and I'm sure this would not be perceived well by, uh, but she said, in the Navy, we give officers a lot of um, independence. We expect them to make decisions that are smart. In the Army, you're not allowed to make any decisions. <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> so, so at that moment, I said, you know, I, I began to reflect on just exactly how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. <laughs> but, well, I have, I have one last question, which yeah. is kind of related to that. Uh, your military experience, did any skills or talents that you developed that, that was useful in your political career? You know, my whole life has been uh, uh, helped by my military experiences. I mean, there's just no substitute for... Uh, as I was trying to uh, describe earlier, the challenge of uh, leading uh, some folks that are very different than you and uh, who, who don't have to uh, respect you unless you earn it. And uh, so that, that was very valuable to me. I got to meet, you know, I'd led a pretty sheltered middle class life. I'd gone from high school to college and then uh, suddenly I'm in the midst of a bunch of sailors and I got to, you know, I got to uh, adjust to that and learn how to relate. So that was, that was valuable, and, as I t and then the other thing, I mean, when you're um, uh, at an early age, I mean, 22 years old, you're running a ship around all by yourself, all by yourself, you know, the captain, anybody, so you're in charge of it. You know, there are 250 souls that, that de uh, de depend on your making proper decisions, so, and sometimes it can be challenging, so uh, after you have that kind of responsibility, you know, in some ways, nothing that comes later can, can match that, just because you're talking about human life and you're talking about age. So uh, I think, it, I think uh, you know, if there's anything, um, I, I, I've approached other things with more calmness maybe than I would have if I hadn't had that experience. I'm so grateful for the experience, but I tell people, you know, I, I'm no hero. Uh, nobody ever shot at me. And uh, like a lot of us in that age group, I mean, uh, the draft was chasing me, and, and I had an opportunity. It was good, but but the um, powerful thing that I learned was that what I got of it was much different and much better than I expected. So, yeah, thank you. Well, at, at this point, I think um, I think your training and and your discipline is self-evident, um, both in your service to the country and the service to our community, and I think. Uh, it's reflected by the confidence that the people of Cincinnati have placed in you throughout the years. And uh, thank you. I want to thank you for the interview, and I want to thank you uh, for your service to our country too. And thank you for your service. Yeah. And we didn't know of all the connections we right. had. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, 